Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hope you're having an amazing day. I'm going to kick this video off with an update concerning Ryzen 7000 series, which of course is based on the Zen 4 microprocessor architecture. AM5 will release later this year, and as I've mentioned numerous times at this point, it is going to be a revelation in performance compared to what we have with Zen 3. While core counts are almost certainly going to remain the same, in fact, one of my sources even told me that the 24 core model is now 100% scrapped. There does actually appear to be a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. There has been a lot of discussion, including a more recent video from myself discussing the power consumption of Ryzen 7000, basically some models will be going up to 170 watts. To my understanding though, in the future there will be Vcash models of Ryzen 7000 which will also launch. Now you can probably make a pretty good prediction that this is the case. After all, AMD have been working on this technology and it's clear that it's pretty successful. But to my understanding, the timeline is that we're not going to see this at launch. There was a little confusion from some whether this was actually going to be the 170 watt TDP models which would feature the V cache, but no. To my understanding, currently, they will basically just be like the Halo SKUs, the highest performance, highest clock, 16 cores, and all of that jazz. But later on, we will indeed see Vcash models. Now, I don't know at this stage whether it's going to be like the 5800 where it's like eight cores or whether we're going to see higher core count variants of Zen 4 which will also feature Vcash. To be honest I suspect that this stuff can change on a dime based upon tons of things like market conditions, competition from Intel, so on and so on. But still I do find it rather interesting and I have actually been told that it looks like 5.3 gigahertz so far is about the highest frequency we can expect from single core. I mentioned this in another video but yet someone else has told me this as well and all core seems to be about 5.1 i'm told that under like really heavy overclocking conditions so think like you know phase change like really high end water obviously your mileage will vary possibly you could get like 5.4 5.5 but i don't think this is going to be something that the average user is going to be kind of getting of course, maybe there could be a jump in quality of the silicon as we hit mass production. Hopefully that's the case. Like, <laughs> it would be amazing if we could hit like 5.5 or core. I just wouldn't bank on it is pretty much where I'm going with this. Either way, it's going to be a revelation that is AM5. I'm really hopeful of the performance. And I suspect that when Intel also releases Raptor Lake, things are going to start to really heat up in many ways, actually, in the CPU market. Obviously, both Intel and AMD have a ton of generation of processors already kind of panned out, and Raptor Lake, Meteor Lake, and so on and so on, are all looking to be really impressive from Intel's side. Ultimately, the 10th generation from Intel was fairly decent, at least in my opinion, although they really did push everything to about the breaking point, of course, with the architecture at that stage. Uh, Skylake pretty much was just like fully tapped out. And then Rocket Lake was interesting. I think it was cool from the perspective of like back porting. And when I actually broke that story that we would actually be seeing Rocket Lake as a back port, I have to say that there was a lot of... A lot of skepticism I had when my source told me that. I was like, really? Um, but obviously it was an interesting... It was an interesting endeavor, let's say. But ultimately, Rocket Lake just wasn't enough. But 12th generation onwards, you know, Older Lake is really good. I have to say that... Uh, I'm really enjoying the 12900K. I'm using as well that along with the 5950X quite a bit at the moment and kind of really enjoying both platforms. And I think that this is excellent for the market in the long term. Ultimately, it's never good when all you can do is recommend one processor vendor or one GPU vendor. As everyone knows, that just kind of makes the market stagnant and we as end users get screwed. Either in terms of just, it's not as fun, honestly, and also, of course, pricing and availability and just about everyone, every other way, excuse me, that you can possibly imagine. But now we're going to move on to Lovelace. I want to give full credit to Igor's lab for this one. And they actually have a PCB design. Now, of course, this could be incorrect as well. We're 
based upon a product which is not released yet but to be fair to Igor he's usually pretty accurate you can see yourself the rough diagram of where everything is from all the MOSFETs the uh, memory <laughs> the actually huge GPU core and so on. And this is an AD102 GPU. So we've got 24 voltage converters for VRMs. And so there's 28 phases total because obviously we need some for memory. M memory does actually require power, of course. I know that might be a shocking revelation. So this is actually slightly higher than what we have for the 3090 if memory serves. This apparently is for the reference PCB. This is not for a custom variant. I'll get into that more in just a second. And Igor has actually said that yes, it's using up to 600 watts. Again, I'll discuss more about power consumption in just a second. But yeah, I mean, that's considerably higher than the 3090 Ti, which is apparently 450 watts. Quite frankly, this thing is looking to be absolutely monstrous. And with the 4090, the 600 watt power consumption, I've mentioned in multiple videos previously, but yeah like i'm hearing 600 watts for the reference design and some of the custom designs can go up to like 700 800 watts what i'm not so certain about at this stage is whether the 7 or 800 watts is going to be like requiring water cooling one source has told me that it does another source it's said it's not it is just requiring let's say elaborate cooling like think three or four slot kind of designs so either way most likely you're not going to want to put this thing into like a small form factor pc like it's just let's say i'm interested in the challenge of seeing how that's going to happen like a small form factor with something like a 13th generation uh intel processor or like a I don't know, 7950X or whatever in, uh, AMD ends up calling their next generation of processors. It's going to be an absolute, it's going to be an absolute behemoth to call that thing. Also, CapFrame X, this is just a, a side, CapFrame X has also leaked some performance uh, numbers regarding the RTX 3090 Ti. I'm not going to spend too long on this because the 3090 Ti is a cool card, not literally, it's really, really warm, um, but it is cool in the fact that it's basically pushing the silicon to the absolute breaking points it's again one of those engineering feats which is kind of teaching board manufacturer aibs you know a ton of things and obviously it's kind of interesting from the power consumption side of things again it's like 450 watts it's apparently around 10 percent faster on average than the rtx 3090 so yeah i mean you can just go on any website or graph for the 3090 like met like mentally add 10 12 percent and you're good to go so you're not exactly getting a revelation in terms of performance however it is probably going to mean that uh nvidia does get the win quote unquote for the fastest card for this generation but as we've said numerous times at this point, Lovelace is probably going to be a little bit slower in traditional raster, but RDNA 3 is going to be a little bit slower in ray tracing, but we'll see how all of that shakes up. And finally, there is a really cool project actually from NVIDIA. As we all know at this stage, like upscaling technology is probably going to be the most important thing going forward even for like mid-range cards or high-end cards because just trying to run games at like 4 or 8k or whatever natively is going to be a tall order even for something like a 1490 if you're enabling all of the ray tracing and all of that but of course there are so many different competing standards you've got fsr um which is now being augmented if you will with fsr 2.0 oh small note on fsr 2.0 i had a couple of people message me that god of war uh 2018 for the pc received a patch which had fsr 2 i'm just gonna let you know that to my understanding because there's actually a note on steam on this it was basically a typo so as far as i'm aware it's only fsr 1 it is not fsr 2.0 that is in the game with that said it's probably a good sign that uh well they're planning to implement fsr 2.0 which is cool anyway i'm looking forward to it hopefully we'll have both fsr 1 and 2 that would be kind of nice like if the if developers had both, I'm just saying, that would be, that would be pretty sweet. Um, anywho, 
Um, yeah, so obviously you've got FSR, you've got XCSS, you've got DLSS. At this stage, I'm pretty sure your local bakery is going to be offering some upscaling solution. Um, but yeah, obviously it also means there's a ton of work on games developers. And there's a really cool thing that NVIDIA have been working on. I will link the WCCF article in the video description. They've, they've done a pretty good write-up. But NVIDIA, in own words, as said, it sits between, that is, of course, the Slipstream SDK. I forgot to actually mention what it's called, which is a failure on my part, but there we go. It sits between the game and the render API and abstracts the SDK-specific API calls into an easy-to-use streamline framework. Instead of manually integrating each SDK, developers simply identify which resources, motion vectors, depth, and so on, are required for the target super resolution plugin, and then set why they want the plugins to run in the graphics pipeline. So currently, obviously, NVIDIA's own tech, so that is DLAA, uh, DLSS, are already supported, and they're going to be supporting NIS pretty soon, but they are planning to also support things like XESS. Again, this is good from the perspective of games developers, and obviously where a upscaling solution actually runs in the pipeline is kind of important, because, for example, you don't want it to interfere with, like, blur, um, like motion blur and that type of thing, if it's, like, one SDK, sorry, uh, one upsampling solution versus another uh, upsampling solution, it needs to be in a slightly different place, possibly. It's a whole topic. I've discussed this actually quite a bit in the XCSS video, which I worked with uh, Intel with. It's a little bit old now. They've released more information, so I'll release an update to that as soon as possible. And FSR 1, I've also worked with AMD, so I uh, will be working on FSR 2 video as well pretty soon. So, yeah, um, that's really cool. But there's also another thing that NVIDIA have been also beavering away at. And this is Kickstart RT SDK. As you probably have guessed, it is to do with ray tracing. Traditionally, game engines, says NVIDIA, must bind all active materials in a scene. Kickstart RT delivers a beautiful ray traced effects while foregoing legacy requirements and invasive changes to existing material systems. Kickstart RT provides a convenient starting point for developers to quickly and easily include realistic dynamic lighting of complex scenes in their game engines in a much shorter time span than traditional methods. I guess it just works. It's also helpful for those who find upgrading their engines to DirectX 12 API difficult. So these bunch of announcements, of course, were at GDC, and it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, while Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, and all of these companies, of course, work on hardware, it's also the software, which is a really big part of all of this. And I suspect that uh, they're all going to be throwing even more cash. Like one of the things that AMD have been really focused on at the moment is the software. To my understanding, anyway, they've really expanded their software teams. But Intel are doing the same thing. Like they're snapping up a crap ton of developers at the moment. And NVIDIA, of course, are always recruiting. So it's going to be really interesting. Again, I know I've said this a hundred times at this point, guys, but... The upscaling wars, as I'm calling them, is going to be curious because ultimately, you know, NVIDIA want their technology at some point or some way or another in their in, in games, right? And obviously Intel and AMD do as well. The one benefit, however, that AMD definitely has over NVIDIA and even Intel is the fact that the FSR will work on consoles and don't you know, don't let that fool you. It's not a small detail. While obviously you still have to do like optimization and all of that, it does make things really quite interesting. We'll see how all of this plays out. But anyway, thanks very much for checking out the video. I will see you soon. If you've enjoyed it, it's YouTube land. So of course, you know what to do. Leave a likey on the video and all of that jazz. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.